Okay, so the first thing I want to do today is uh, talk through with y'all the paper two assignment. Um, so you're going to be doing this in three stages, right? The first stage is actually going to be um, an annotated bibliography. You're also going to do a 500 word proposal and a 2,000 to 3,000 word research paper on one text from the course which cannot be the same one you wrote paper one about. And you're going to come up with an original argument using secondary sources. Um, so does anybody have any questions about the basic assignment? I know you've all had a, a minute to look this over. Um, does anybody have any questions about the elements of the basic assignment? Okay, good. Um, so how many of you have done an annotated bibliography before? Okay, great, that's good. At this stage, you should have done one before. Um, so I will give everybody a sample to work from and more specific directions um, as we get closer to the due date for that. Um, but yeah, I want everybody to, like I want y'all to do that part first. Right? I want you to do the research before you actually start writing the paper. Um, so, in terms of the kinds of sources that are acceptable, right, you're going to need at least five, no more than seven, secondary sources, and they must all be scholarly peer-reviewed sources, right? So try to stick to things you get from the library, uh, not things that you find online. Now, um, I don't want to hear anybody complaining that they can't find any sources. Why? What do I give you at the beginning of most class yeah, periods? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? So you can use those as a starting point, right? And then one of the best things to do when you're doing research, right, is, um, you know, maybe, you know, get, say, your first two sources. See what they have to say about the topic and also see what sources they're both citing, right? If there are particular sources that it seems like everybody writing on a particular topic cites, those are probably pretty central foundational um, arguments, right? So see if you can find your sources' sources, and that'll help you to complete the paper. Um, so in the annotation for each uh, tech, uh, source here, right? I'm going to want you to describe the argument the source makes in a rough, uh, I'm going to want, want you to um, give me the author's credentials, right, make sure this is a responsible person who actually knows what the hell they're talking about, and tell me how you intend to use the source in the paper. And the annotated bibliography is going to be due on the 1st of December, right, so that's due in a little less than a month. The proposal is going to be similar to the proposal you did for paper one, right? 500 to 750 words. You're going to give me a thumbnail sketch of your argument, um, <coughs> including a state. Oh, what, what the hell's going on? Okay. <laughs> including a statement of the question you're trying to answer your current working thesis, the most important background information your reader is going to need, and a brief overview of the state of current scholarship, right? That is what you're going to need for the annotated bibliography. Sorry. Or not for the annotated bibliography, for the proposal, right? So does anybody have any questions about the proposal? Right, you've already done this, right? So this is just doing the same thing again with a different text. So for the final paper, you're going to use the annotated bibliography, the proposal, and the feedback I've given you on both assignments to produce a 2,000 to 3,000 word researched argument. So. I've given you some guidelines here for working with the sources. Um, you can look these over at your leisure. Um, 
The one thing that I do want to emphasize here, and I know this is something I always emphasize, um, anybody who uses phrases like in today's society or back in the day, right? I will seek you out and apply mild but memorable electrical shocks until you stop doing that. All right, be specific about your historical contexts. All right, so the annotated bibliography is due on the 1st of December. The proposal is due on the 8th, and the final paper is due on Tuesday the 14th. So does anybody have any questions about it? Not yet. <laughs> okay, if questions arise, you know, later on as you are working, please do get in touch with me, right? Um, I'm happy to sit in the office and look over a draft with you. Um, and remember also that you do get extra points for extra credit for going to the Writing Center. So if you go to the Writing Center with this, right, you'll get half A letter grades, extra credits. Um, I also have here on the back, of the sheet, um, the grading rubric, right? The grading standards that uh, I follow for this assignment. So try to keep what is listed as an A as an A paper standard in mind here as you are uh, as you are writing. Okay. Um, oh, um, I do also want to note. Um, I can't remember now exactly when I told you um, the revisions to paper one were due. I think they were this coming Friday, but they may have been earlier. If they were earlier. I'll give you a couple extra days to do that if you want to, right? So yeah, you can have till this Friday to do that. Um, it's just, it's, it's, been, uh, it's been a week. Okay, uh, so Nick, you have something for us today, yes? Yep. All right, so I had to populate uh, Bethany's region called mm -hmm. Alakatashio, and these are the Alakatashians. They're uh, nomadic tribal people. Okay. They're, um, they go from place to place in their territory, which is mainly a very mountainous area. Uh -huh. um, they're very Native American-like okay. uh, in, in terms of beliefs. Like They don't feel that they should waste any animal material. If they hunt an animal, they're going to use every piece and part of it. Okay. Um, also, they're surrounded by horses, which technically that's pre-European, but or that's not pre-European. That's right. Hey, that's secondary world, right? Yeah, secondary yeah. world. <laughs> um, they'll eat most of anything if it has nutrient value or if they are well known with whatever they're eating. So okay. uh, they're also a hunter-gatherer economy. They all hunt and gather food and they collectively eat it. Everybody gets their share, except for those who participate in Pyongyang, which in their tongue means uh, competition. Uh, Hyongjang uh, is a competitive triathlon, uh, running, horseback riding, and mountain climbing. Uh, mo uh, but nobody ever finishes this competition because um, they either give up by the time they reach the tallest mountain, because the tallest mountain has a fabled wizard there, and anybody who enters this uh, his territory, or what is deemed as his territory, never comes back. Uh, the wizard, nobody knows much about him beyond that. He lives in seclusion at the highest peak of the mountain. Um, yeah, okay, that, that's just for you. Winner uh, the winner receives Dijie Yoktu, um, which is uh, ambrosia, or in their tongue, it's ambrosia. It's essentially okay. ambrosia. Uh -huh. um, nectar of the heavenly gods, which was left there by accident by Disco whenever he uh, took one of his voyages to uh -huh. Alakatashio. Um, way, 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 way to tie it into your previous work. <laughs> <there. Yeah. laughs> um, it has been a coveted um, liquid, I guess. Uh, for its golden glow and its sweet smell. Um, the effects of this, which very, uh, nobody's been able to drink it, but the effects of it would be immediate inebriation as well as divine fate. So whatever fate you have been predisposed to by the gods will be changed and reviewed by the gods if you were to drink this ambrosia, or at least that's how the myth goes. Huh. 
Um, other inhabitants of Alicataccio are mammoth donkeys, Rocky Mountain horses, and the result of breed breeding the two, which is a very large horse. <laughs> very large mule. Okay. Um, they are the companions of the Alicataccians. They, uh, they're big lumbering around horses, and instead of enslaving them, there is a symbiotic relationship that has developed over years and years. And the horses, by instinct, know that if they help the humans, they will get the sustenance. Um, also, the Alicataccians have been isolated from the rest of the world, for the most part. Um, they do not welcome outsiders, although they are very peaceful and they will not harm anybody who comes to them, but they will not be welcoming. Okay. Um, so they're a little bit xenophobic, but not violent about it. Yeah. Okay. Um, wild fruits and vegetables. Uh, the food sources they have are wild fruits and vegetables. They're hunter-gatherers. Uh -huh. um, apples, peaches, rich fruits, and uh, wild corn and tomatoes. I'm, I'm assuming that since it's a mountainous area, it's got very loamy soil, which peaches don't make sense, but she mentioned that there's peaches there in <laughs> the secondary world. All right. <laughs> um, wild game includes jackrabbits, hind, large tusk boars, and buffalo. Okay. Um, and for clothing, they wear very heavy, thick animal coats because they're in the mountains and it's very cold. And that's what I've got in my notes. All right, awesome. Thank you very much. All right, cool. Okay. So um, we're skipping the end of that hideous strength just because of scheduling issues, like my scheduling issues. Um, so we're just moving right to Wizard of Earthsea. So um, have any of you read a Wizard of Earthsea before? Or was this familiar to any of you? I'm guessing that none of you saw the abysmal uh, Sci-Fi Channel um, adaptation of this uh, from the uh, early 2000s. It's for the best if you didn't. Is it by this name, Wizard of Earthsea? It's, I think it's just called Earthsea, and it kind of collapses the first two books in the trilogy together. Um, but all the characters, like, well, one problem is that all the characters are white people when we're kind of distinctly told here that they're not. Um, but there are various other issues and problems. It's, it's not good. It's not good. All right, so um, how'd this go for you? What'd you think of it? Again. Okay. Why is that? Why did it make you want to go to that movie specifically? Because of the way they use language. Okay. As a means of like language, not just any words, but the special words have their own power. Whether it's to okay. Call the herd of goats all around you, or to bring the mountain down from the sky. Okay. And it just reminded me of Merlin. Yeah, magic here is affected mostly through language, right? In particular, kind of, they were told, you know, this, you know, this, the particular language, the old speech, right? Which is still spoken by dragons, <clears throat> and it is in the old, like the names of things in the old speech are their real, true names, right? And then, in order to permanently change a thing. Or in order to really change a thing and not simply change its appearance, right? You have to change its name. So naming and identity are very closely connected. Here. Yeah, the, they mentioned that like you have the name you're born with, and then when you turn 13, you have the name your your true name. Yeah. Is given to you on that day. And you also acquire a use name. Right? Yeah. So you've got your birth name, right? The name your mother gives you. You are given your true name when you become an adult. And at the same time you acquire your true name, you also acquire a use name because giving your true name out to other people is dangerous because it gives them power over you, right? When you know a thing's true name, right, you can control it, right? We see this, for example, in Ged's um, confrontation with the dragon, right? He is able to get the, get the dragon to do what he wants 
because he knows its true name and thus can, you know, can threaten to harm it, right? So yes, and our main character here, Ged, right, has three names. Right? The name he's given at birth is Dooney. His true name given to him as an adult is Ged. And his use name is Sparrowhawk, right? So all three of these names refer to the same person. Yeah, yes, yeah, so, yeah, so the, the idea of the, of the, the name, ha your name having power um, is uh, not necessarily a new or original one, right? Yeah, this is something that, it's a pretty common motif in folklore. Yeah, it's like with demons. Like, if you know a demon's true name, you can control Yeah, yeah, that's actually a very common Dungeons and Dragons trope. <laughs> yeah, if, you, if you know their true name, you have their amulet, <laughs> then, uh, yeah, you can, make them, you can make them do what you want. So it's still a very, very dangerous thing. What else, uh, so what else did you guys pull out of this? Uh, anything else that you all noticed that you want to talk about? Kind of reminded me of Frankenstein in the way it sounded like his, like that spirit, ghost, evil plot. Okay. Yeah, and it's something that's his own creation, right? So yeah, we have here, yeah, protagonist. Pursued by his own creation, right? For which he kind of has yet to take full responsibility, right? But yeah, that's, yeah, um, you know, that's actually, I had never really thought about how this is like Frankenstein. But you're absolutely right. This is actually very, very similar. He uses a process like, well, in this case, magic, not magic-y science, right? To call something into the world that he then can't control. And what is it that causes him to bring this thing into the world? Yeah. What's that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a, like his ignorance and his arrogance is constantly highlighted. Uh huh. Particularly early on, yeah. Like after the shadow attacks him, he seems to be changed, right? Once uh, things are no longer so easy for him because he develops a stutter and his hands don't work quite as uh, deftly as they used to. Um, Right, he, his magical learning slows down a little bit, right? And he has, to, he has to catch up to people who used to be behind him. So that seems to do a little bit to his pride and arrogance, right? But, in, in, bless you, but again, in both cases where the shadow kind of gets called forth, right? Like, he is showing off, right? First, right, he's showing off for that girl, right, for the daughter of the Lord of Realby. Right, he's like, yeah, of course I can call up a spirit, right? Of course I can do all these things. Why would you think I couldn't? And then the more dangerous calling is when he is trying to um, make his rival Jasper read his words, right? He feels he's been provoked by this other guy. He's like, oh yeah, I'll show you. I'll summon up a spirit of the dead and then, then you'll see. So yeah, we have here a character who is motivated on a certain level by pride and arrogance to create something or bring something into the world that he has no control over. And 
that is potentially dangerous not just to himself but also to other people, right? But then let's think about it. Like, so this is how Ged is similar to Victor Frankenstein, right? Let's think about how he might also be different from him, right? How, how do we go in a different direction here from what Victor Frankenstein was all about? Ogion. Ogion. When first yes. walking with Ogion, when will I learn something? When will I do this? And Ogion points to a plant. What is that? Uh huh. Okay, that's its common name. You have to first learn its true name, and then, like from there on, he actually like listens to his teacher, mm -hmm. Victor Frankenstein. Said, Screw it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Essentially, to his professors, like I'm, I'm tired of your limitations. I'll just go do it myself. Uh huh. But I think also to, when we look at um, maybe Victor Frankenstein's education, right? He had formal education. Yeah, his formal education. Yeah, he had professors who were kind of encouraging him to go above and beyond, right? And then like Ogion is like the boy. Yeah, if we yeah, yeah for one thing, a yeah, humbler background. You know, he's a, a peasant child. But yeah, I think also, yeah, if we look at the way, particularly the way he was taught, right, by his uh, first wizard teacher, Ogion the Silent, right? Yeah, that Ogion is primarily interested in teaching him patience, right? And in getting him to understand limitations. If we think about like the things that the word silent here implies, right? If Ogion is silent most of the time, what does that then give him a greater capacity for doing? Listening. Yeah. He's not talking, he's listening. I think that this is actually really pretty important given what we learn um, about the nature of magic. Uh, later on, like when um, Ged has his conversation with the Master Hand, right, the illusionist. Um, can we turn to page 58 here? Um, and can I get somebody to start reading for us the last paragraph there, um, starting with the master hand looked at the jewel that glittered on Ged's palm. 58. Oh, God, do you have different page numbers than I do? No, probably. Ah, shit. <laughs> All right. Um, it, is in, it is in chapter, um, chapter 3. trade paperback and not the mass market paperback. Curses. All right. Well, anyway, you know to read the rest of the book for next time. <laughs> I think well, you, as, as long, you're supposed to read chapter. Uh, you're supposed to read chapters one through five for today. Oh. Okay. So yeah, you may have actually ended up reading more. Yeah. Okay. Can somebody read? Uh, if, if someone who has it, read it for us, please. The master hand looked at the jewel that glittered on Jet's palm, bright as the prize of the dragon's horn. The old master murmured one word: hope. And, then, and there lay the pebble, no jewel, but a rough gray bit of rock. The master took it and held it out on his own hand. This is a rock. Talk in the true speech, he said, looking mildly up at Jed now. A bit of the stone of which Roke Isle is made, a little bit of the dry land on which men live. It is itself. It is part of the world. By the illusion change, you can make it look like a diamond. 
or a flower or a fly or an eye or a flame. The rock flickered from shape to shape as he named them and returned to the rock. But that is mere seeming. Illusion fools the beholder's senses. It makes them see and hear and feel that the thing is changed, but it does not change the thing. To change this rock into a jewel, you must change its true name. And to do that, my son, even to so small the scrap of the world is to change the world. It can be done. Indeed, it can be done. It is, the ma it is the art of the master changer, and you will learn it when you are ready to learn it. But, <clears throat> but you must not change one thing, one pebble, one grain of sand, until you know what good and evil will follow on that act. The world is in balance and equilibrium. A wizard's power of changing it and of summoning can change the balance of the world. It is dangerous, that power. It is most perilous. It must follow knowledge and serve me. To light a candle is to cast a shadow. Okay, thank you. So what's the lesson here imparted by the master hand about magic? For a reaction, there is an equal reaction. <laughs> Essentially, yeah, that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction, right? Right. You change one thing in the world, right? And it also changes everything else. Right? Rippling outward from that one thing that you altered. Right, so no change in the world is without consequence. You turn that rock into a diamond, it's not a rock anymore. And everything else that was connected to or dependent on that rock is also then unalterably changed, right? So the lesson that he's trying to impart to get here is, again, that same kind of lesson, lesson of patience that Ogion was trying to teach to him, right? And to acknowledge the, limitate, like, the limitations, not necessarily on your power, but on what you ought to do with that power. And how you ought to, you know, how you ought to consider the possible consequences of every change that you make. You know, he says in the next paragraph, right? A rock is a good thing too, you know. Right? Don't criticize the rock for not being a diamond, right? Appreciate the rock for what it is. The fact that it's not a diamond isn't a flaw, right? That's its nature. And everything needs to remain here in balance. Right? There's a lot of talk about balance. Which overuse of magic can upset. Now, um... <clears throat> If we turn to uh, turn a few pages further to the lessons of the master namer, right? Where he talks about the name of the sea, right? The sea's name is Inian, well and good. But what we call the inmost sea has its own name also in the old speech. Since no thing can have two true names, Inian can only mean all the sea except the inmost sea. And of course, it does not mean even that, for there are seas and bays and straits beyond counting that bear names of their own. So if some mage sea master were mad enough to try to lay a spell of storm or calm over all the ocean, he must say not only that word Inian, but the name of every stretch and bit and part of the sea through all the archipelago and all the outer reaches and beyond to where names cease. Thus. That which gives us the power to work magic sets the limits of that power. A mage can control only what is near him, what he can name exactly and wholly. And this as well. If it were not so, the wickedness of the powerful or the folly of the wise would long ago have sought to change what cannot be changed, and equilibrium would fail. The unbalanced sea would overwhelm the islands where we perilously dwell, and in the old silence, all voices and all names would be lost. So what's the lesson to extract from this? About how magic works. What's that? Um, magic that, um, it's 
essentially a baby needs to stay within the, his own range. Okay. And not to exceed that. Because while there is great power, mm -hmm. that power has its limits. And what sets those limits? What's magic based on? Yeah, it's based on names, right? So what are the only things a mage is able to con actually exert control over? What he knows the name of and what's near him. Yeah. yeah. Things that are nearby that he can name, right? Those are the limitations on what the wizard can do. Should he try to exceed those limitations, it upsets any, any sense of balance, right? And is possibly destructive. The way the equilibrium is uh -huh. like discussed, it almost reminds me of the force. Okay. Well, you know, there's actually, you know, it's, it's interesting that you mention that because they're actually coming from a similar inspiration. Um, the Jedi religion and the system of magic in a Wizard of Earthsea are both inspired uh, by a Chinese religion called Taoism. Are any of you familiar at all with Taoism or with Taoist thought? Okay. We've talked about it in world religion. Okay. I've got to write papers on it for Dr. Bergen. Okay. I think we may have, did we do the Tao Te Ching when you took World Lit with me long, yes. long ago? Yeah, okay, so you've had, you've had some exposure to this. Okay, good. So, you know, you, and you know the name, you just don't remember anything specific about it. Okay. So, those of you who do remember some things about Taoism, what do you remember about it? Yeah, Nonviolent and living in harmony with nature. Okay, yeah, the primary idea is living in harmony with nature, exactly. And how does one do this if one is trying to follow Tao, which means the way? Living a quiet life, like you don't go out of your way to fight with your neighbor or uh -huh. out of your way to disturb nature in any sense. Yeah, no, that's, yeah, um, you're, 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 you're doing fine. Um, yeah, um, I think, like, like, the big idea here in Taoism is to, to live a life without striving, right? Right, that you shouldn't struggle to acquire riches or status or fame, glory, whatever, right? That all of those things are fleeting. They upset the natural balance of things. And that the best thing for you to do is passively accumulate inner strength, right? That um, one of the most common um, Taoist uh, metaphors for following the way is um, an empty jar, right? So, typically, right, we see an empty jar, <coughs> and what do we think about? Putting things in. Yeah, what can I put in that, right? What can I fill it with? To the Taoist, the empty space is what's most important, because what that is is potential, right? That empty space is potential energy. So by maintaining that emptiness, you keep that potential open, right? right? You know, they also tend to use as metaphors, you know, the idea of like, like an uncarved block of wood, right? The uncarved block of wood is actually more powerful and more interesting than the carved block because it's still in the pro like it's still becoming, right? Its fate isn't set yet. 
right? A river running in its course under the, the rock that's worn smooth, be the rock that's worn smooth by the river, right? Not the rock that um, interrupts the river's flow. So yeah, so it's a lot of Taoist philosophy sounds, you know, particularly to Westerners, passive, right? Um, and you know, one of the interesting paradoxes of Taoism, which is kind of based on paradoxes anyway, um, is that if you try to consciously follow the way, you have already fucked it up. Right? It's something that you just kind of have to do unconsciously. Right? You can't make a decision to say, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow the Tao today. Right? And no, it doesn't work that way. If you try to do that, you've already failed. So yeah, it's a um, it's a religious tradition that, um, or a philosophical tradition, that <clears throat> encourages you to kind of like rest and gather your strength, rather than to expend your energy in the acquisition of goods and status and things like that. Right. So this makes sense to everybody. Everybody got it? yeah. And so yeah, the, the yeah the Jedi religion is is based on the same set of ideas. And yeah, um, Legin uh, was an anthropologist by training. So she is very much inspired by this particular religion and the way she creates magic for this particular world, right? Now, the other two major inspirations for this that I want to know before we move on, um, there were a couple of big ideas that she wanted to work with, right? One, first question that occurred to her as she sat down to start writing this is, right, why are there never any stories about young wizards? Right, and she says, if you look at the, uh, the classic um, fantasy wizard, it's almost always an old man in a cloak with a tall hat and a staff a long white beard um, who is already established in power when you meet him, right? And she's thinking, well, you know, Gandalf and Merlin and these other wizard figures, right, all must have been young at some time, right? So what were they like when they were still youths learning their craft, right? And that's where the inspiration for the character Ged comes from, right? The other thing that she wanted to do was, or the other question she wanted to try to resolve here, right, is why do nearly all fantasy worlds look like some version of medieval Europe. That's right, it's fantasy. You could conceivably make the world look like anything you want it to. But so much popular fantasy just creates this kind of secondary version of an already existing world, an already existing time period, right? It's like, why not? actually make something that's weird and different, right? So she decides <clears throat> to think about like what life would be like in a secondary world that's composed almost entirely of it's composed entirely of islands, right? Most of the islands in like if you look at the map, like most of the islands in Earthsea are small and boats in the sea are very central to most people's lives. Although if you live on a large enough island, for example, you know, um, we're told that Ged, being from an island called Gaunt, uh, which has mountains on it, right, there are people like him who live in the mountains who, you know, as children, have no experience of the sea. But yeah, but by and large, the whole idea of the sea, even like the way, that, like the uses people make of magic, right, like one of the kinds of magician that we're constantly introduced to here is like the, the weather worker, right? Somebody who does weather work would be extremely important 
in a society that is based primarily on sea travel, right? Making sure that the weather is um, always adequate <clears throat> for getting around in a boat. She also wanted to make sure that readers knew that the characters in a fantasy novel didn't all have to be from European type societies, right? So we're told that you know most of you know when she describes physically most of the characters here, most of them are non-white, right? So we're told, for example, that Ged has black hair and copper-colored skin, right? That Jasper, his rival, and his friend Vetch are both dark-skinned, right? Um, in general, the only light-skinned, blonde-haired people are the barbarians who come raiding in the first chapter, right? So let's actually kind of turn and have a look at that because I think that that is uh, kind of particularly interesting um, in light of some of the other things that we've been reading. So uh, if somebody can turn to the paragraph in the first chapter that starts with, in those days the Kargad Empire was strong. stop there, right? So let's think about this description of the cards, right? What are they what do they like? What do they look like? What are their what do they do? Okay, yeah, they're raiders, right? Does there seem to be any point to their raiding? Yeah, it seems to be like mere destruction, right? Right, they don't seem to be stealing anything, right? You know, they're not like stealing cattle, right? They're killing the cattle along with the people. What else do we know about the cards, apart from the fact that they're, they're destroyers? Okay, yeah, they're they're the only characters that look European. Just about the only other character we see described as white skinned is the, the Archmage Nemerly, but he's described as though all the color has been bleached out of him, right? Which I think is a more kind of symbolic kind of thing. You know, it's that he has uh, worked so long with wizardly light that all of the shadow is kind of bleached out of his body, right? And yeah, and the cards are also foreigners, right? Right, they come from outside the main archipelago. 
to have their own little empire, kind of off to the side, right? They don't speak the language. Yeah, they speak their own language. They also seem to be the only ones uh, that actually have a religion, right? Which is only kind of obliquely referred to. Um, <clears throat> the cards stumbling on them drove their lances or hacked with their swords, yelling their war cry, the names of the white god brothers of Atuan, Wulua, Atwa. So these are the only gods actually mentioned in the text and they're mentioned by barbarians, right? There doesn't seem to, like, the people of the archipelago don't seem to have any kind of organized religion or any real religion to speak of, like, apart from maybe the wizard's respect for the balance and harmony of all things, right? So yeah, they also have a weird religion that's not really explained, but given that their war cry is the names of their gods, it also suggests that their raiding is religiously motivated in some sense, right? Or that they think that these, these gods give them strength and purpose or some such thing, right? So, <clears throat> the reason I point this out is that I feel like, like what we have here in the Kargads and the way they're depicted here is something sort of like the way an imperialist colonialist power might be perceived by the people who are being attacked by that imperialist colonialist power, right? A bunch of yellow-haired barbarians with a weird religion who are running up the rivers, burning and pillaging everything in sight, right? And it's made clear yeah, that the Kargads are very much outsiders. <clears throat> and Ged's first real act of magic, right? His first noteworthy act is to do what? How, what, 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 is, what is it that the first thing that gets him noticed? As he, the, he brings the mist and fog, he uses it to like trick the car guy. Yeah, he does the trick with the mist and fog, right? To trick the car guys, and thus to do what? Yeah, his first real act of wizardry is to save his village, right? To protect his community. Meanwhile, we're told that um, his first teacher in magic, right, his aunt, the witch, is doing what while the car gets raided? Hiding in a cave. She's hiding by herself in a cave, which she's boarded off, right? It's like in this first chapter they refer to as, like, women's magic is wicked. Yeah, that's, like, one of the, one of the, funny things about this is the way they, yeah, they seem to regard magic as kind of gendered, right? Now, <clears throat> I think some of this is actually coming also from Taoist principles. Okay, I'm going to draw a symbol on the board, and y'all tell me if you recognize it.
What's that? It's yeah. This is the yin yang symbol. And does anyone know what yin and yang mean? Okay. And you have to have a little, each has to have a little of the other in order to be balanced. Right, hence the small white circle in the, the black yin side, right, and the small black circle in the white yang side, right? And the yin, it's considered like, it's the moon, it's uh, shadows, and the uh -huh. yin is the sun and the light. Yep. Yin is associated with darkness, yang with light. Um, yin is associated with uh, the moist or the wet and with the cold. Yang is associated with dryness, with heat. Yin is passive. Yang is active. And Taoist thought generally privileges the yin over the yang. Right? Because passivity is how you gather strength, is how you gather power. Yang is expending power, expending energy. And I think like, like one of the interesting things that happens um, to this dynamic in A Wizard of Earthsea is that it kind of gets reversed in the magic system here, right? The wizards, the male wizards, are actually much more passive than the female witches. Right? The witch, for example, uses magic primarily to do things, right? You know, for action. Uh, if we look at, um, but she has a charm for every instance. Yeah. Um, let's see. Right. There's a saying on Gaunt, "Weak as woman's magic," and there's another saying, "Wicked as woman's magic." Now, the witch of ten altars was no black sorceress nor did she ever meddle with the high arts or traffic with old powers. But being an ignorant woman among ignorant folk, she often used her crafts to foolish and dubious ends. She knew nothing of the balance in the pattern, which the true wizard knows and serves, and which keeps him from using his spells unless real need demands. She had a spell for every circumstance and was forever weaving charms. Much of her lore was mere rubbish and humbug, nor did she know the true spells from the false. She knew many curses, and was better at causing sickness, perhaps, than at curing it. Like any village witch, she could brew up a love potion, but there were other, uglier brews she made to serve men's jealousy and hate. Such practices, however, she kept from her young apprentice, and as far as she was able, she taught him honest craft. So what do we, what, what's the, the read here on the witch's magic? Okay, it does more harm than good, right? And it's, she uses it for like gain instead of to help. Okay, yeah. Most of it is used for personal gain or for revenge, right? So it's used for trivial purposes. And this is the first instruction that Ged receives in magic, right? Um, I think actually, like to go back to the comment Grace made at the beginning of class about Frankenstein, I think there's a similarity here too, right? What do we remember about Frankenstein's first um, <clears throat> teachers of science? Where did he first learn science? From outdated alchemists. Yeah, from these outdated texts by alchemists like um, Cornelius Agrippa and Paracelsus, right? And I think that. The fact that Ged learns his first magic from this witch who uses magic primarily to do things without caring about the balance or the pattern is part of what leads him down this road later on. Right. 
<clears throat> the earliest he instruction he receives has nothing to do with balance or pattern or equilibrium. And I think it's interesting, too, that the last lessons that the wizards receive, just going along, the, along these lines, are from the master patterner. And these are the only lessons that the wizards on Roke are given that are not described to us. Right, if we go, um, to the description of the imminent grove, right? The Archmage sent Ged, um, it's page 99 in my book, it's near the end of chapter four, right? The Archmage sent Ged after his 18th birthday to work with the master patterner. What is learned in the imminent grove is not much talked about elsewhere. It is said that no spells are worked there. <laughs> And yet the place itself is an enchantment. Sometimes the trees of that grove are seen, and sometimes they are not seen, and they are not always in the same place and part of Rogue Island. It is said that the trees of the grove themselves are wise. It is said that the master patterner learns his supreme majory there within the grove. And if ever the trees should die, so shall his wisdom die. And in those days, the waters will rise and drown the islands of Earth Sea, which Seagoy raised from the depths in the time before myth, all the lands where men and dragons dwell. But all this is hearsay. Wizards will not speak of it. So first off, let's let's just look at the name here, Master Patterner, right? And the fact that the master patterner teaches the last lessons that these wizards learn. Well, just about, with one exception we'll mention in a minute. What does the name, what does the name patterner suggest? There's a pattern. Okay, that there, there must be a pattern, right? He probably teaches them the true pattern of the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I mean, this, this may sound like a basic or stupid question, right? But what is a pattern? The repeating process. Yeah. If you're examining a pattern, right, you're looking at the ways in which all the things in that pattern are connected. So the last thing that they're studying would be connections, right? To connect that back to uh, Frankenstein, that sounds a lot like natural philosophy. Yeah, when, when you think of it, yeah, that, of that whole system of correspondences, right? That, you know, even, you know, be, you know, because, you know, because my birthday is in late March, um, you know, I should have some of the characteristics of the ram, right? Or that um, grinding up a ruby in red wine is supposed to be good for blood disorders or things like that, right? Yeah. But yeah, like, like it, it, it's there's a logic to it, right? It's not a scientific. It's not to us a scientific logic, because we have a different view of how the world operates, right? But I think yeah, that, that worldview is probably closer to what's going on in the game's novel here. That these correspondences between things. But I think also to connect it to other things we've already seen in the novel, if all things are connected to each other, right? You need to learn how they're connected. Because if you change one thing, you change everything else, right? And the place where these lessons are taught is the imminent grove. Now, <clears throat> what does the word imminent mean? Does anybody know? Imminent with an A, not imminent with an I. Like, like now? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that would be imminent with an I, right? You know, something that's coming very soon, right? So if a tidal wave is imminent, right? 
it means there's one heading in our direction and we better get the hell out of the way, right? Imminent refers to a power, um, you know, whether divine or magical or whatever, that is operating within or through something, right? So imminent here refers to like, like inherent magical power. So they learn so the wizards learn how things are connected to each other in a place that exudes its own inherent power, right? Now I mentioned that the master patterner teaches the next to last lessons that Gid has to learn. Who teaches him the last lessons he has to learn? Who's the last of the masters that he interacts with? Master Doorkeeper. Yeah. And what is that lesson like? What is the lesson he learns from the Master Doorkeeper? Who teaches both the first and the last lessons, right? What did he have to do to get in? You had to give him his name, right? Now remember what the significance of the true name is here, right? <clears throat> so what does that signify if you have to give your name to get into the school of wizardry? You have to give some of your power away. Okay, yeah, you have to give up some of your power, right? And what else do you have to do then? You have to ask for his name to leave, right? Mm -hmm. You have to you have to guess his or guess his name to leave, right? But if you're giving him your name, what else are you doing? Remember, like it was for example, when Vetch gives Ged his true name, what is that a gesture of? Trust. It's a gesture of trust. Yeah. You are saying that I trust you, not to misuse this, right? I am giving you the means to control me or to limit me in some way, right? Because I trust you. And yeah, in order to get out, you have to guess the doorkeeper's name. How does Ged get around the how, how does Ged guess the doorkeeper's name? He asks. He's yeah. He just asks for it, right? And is given it. Right? <clears throat> and that's the lesson there, right? You know, he says, Master. I cannot take your name from you not being strong enough, and I cannot trick your name from you not being wise enough. So I am content to stay here and learn or serve whatever you will, unless by chance you will answer a question I have. Ask it. What is your name? The doorkeeper smiled and said his name, and Ged, repeated it, repeating it, entered for the last time into that house. So what's the purpose of this last lesson? Trust and respect. Okay, yeah, trust and respect, right? Just as was the purpose of the first lesson. And what else? What won't get again what he wants here? Magic. Yeah, he can't use magic to do this, right? So part of the lesson here is that... Don't rely solely on your magic. Yeah, there are some things that magic can't do for you, right? or that normal means that don't upset the balance can better accomplish. Now the last thing that I want to turn to, and I'll give you the reading questions for next time, I do want to look for a minute just so that we're thinking about this 
as we leave to um, Ged's summoning of the shadow. Slopes of Roke Knoll went up dark into the darkness of summer night before moonrise. You have the, the page number? 69. 69. Okay, thank you. It's 81 in mine, so I don't know. <laughs> the presence of that hill where many wonders had been worked was heavy, like a weight in the air about them. As they came onto the hillside, they thought of how the roots of it were deep, deeper than the sea, reaching down even to the old, blind, secret fires of the world's core. They stopped on the east slope. Stars hung over the black grass above them on the hill's crest. No wind blew. Ged went a few paces up the slope, away from the others, and turning, said in a clear voice, Jasper, whose spirit shall I call? Call whom you like. None will listen to you. Jasper's voice shook a little, with anger, perhaps. Ged answered him softly, mockingly, Are you afraid? He did not even listen for Jasper's reply if he made one. He no longer cared about Jasper. Now that they stood on Rope Knoll, hate and rage were gone, replaced by utter certainty. He need envy no one. He knew that his power this night on this dark enchanted ground was greater than it had ever been, filling him till he trembled with a sense of strength barely kept in check. He knew now that Jasper was far beneath him, had been sent perhaps only to bring him here tonight, no rival but a mere servant of Ged's destiny. Under his feet, he felt the hill roots going down and down into the dark, and over his head, he saw the dry, far fires of the stars. Between, all things were his to order, to command. He stood at the center of the world. Don't be afraid, he said, smiling. I'll call a woman spirit. You need not fear a woman. Elfar and I will call, the fair lady of the deed of Enlod. She died a thousand years ago. Her bones lie afar into the Sea of Ea, and maybe there never was such a woman. Do years and distances matter to the dead? Do the songs lie? Ged said with the same gentle mockery. And then saying, watch the air between my hands. He turned away from the others and stood still. In a great slow gesture, he stretched out his arms, the gesture of welcome that opens an invocation. He began to speak. He had read the runes of the spell of summoning in Ogion's book two years and more ago, and never since had seen them. In darkness he had read them then. Now in this darkness, it was as if he read them again on the page open before him in the night. But now he understood what he read, speaking it aloud word after word, and he saw the markings of how the spell must be woven with the sound of the voice and the motion of body and hand. The other boy stood watching, not speaking, not moving unless they shivered, until unless they shivered a little, for the great spell was beginning to work. Ged's voice was soft still, but changed with a deep singing in it, and the words he spoke were not known to them. He fell silent. Suddenly the wind rose, roaring in the grass. Ged dropped to his knees and called out aloud. Then he fell forward as if to embrace earth with his outstretched arms. And when he rose, he held something dark in his straining hands and arms, something so heavy that he shook with effort getting to his feet. The hot wind whined in the black tossing grasses on the hill. If the stars shone now, none saw them. The words of the enchantment hissed and mumbled on Ged's lips. And then he cried out aloud the name, cried out aloud and clearly, Elfarin. Again he cried the name, Elfarin. And the third time, Elfarin. The shapeless mass of darkness he had lifted split apart. It sundered, and a pale spindle of light gleamed between his open arms, a faint oval reaching from the ground up to the height of his raised hands. In the oval of light for a moment, there moved a form, a human shape, a tall woman looking back over her shoulder. Her face was beautiful and sorrowful and full of fear. Only for a moment did the spirit glimmer there. Then the sallow oval between Ged's arms grew bright. It widened and spread, a rent in the darkness of the earth and night, a ripping open of the fabric of the world. Through it blazed a terrible brightness. And through that bright misshapen breach clambered something like a clot of black shadow, quick and hideous. And it leaped straight out at Ged's face. So we're going to stop there.